Naomi, it's such an honor to be here and to host this really uh, important and exciting panel on global perspectives on energy access in developing economies. Uh, I'm, again, just honored to have this panel of really incredible women who are approaching this challenge from many different perspectives. So I will, without further ado, jump into introducing them. Uh, and I'd also like to reiterate Naomi's uh, prompt to submit questions throughout the time that we have with us today. Um, I'm going to leave some time for Q&A at the very end of the panel, but I will also uh, pepper in questions as we go if, uh, if interesting ones get submitted. So please go ahead and do that. Uh, our first panelist is Sudeshna Ghosh Banerjee. She's practice manager for Europe and Central Asia at the Energy and Extractives Global Practice for the World Bank. Uh, this means that she's responsible for managing a wide range of energy operations and policy engagements for the bank. Previously, she was the energy practice manager in East Africa. An economist by training, her focus is on project economics, M&E, and a broad range of issues, including the energy transition, energy access, renewable energy, subsidy deliveries, and economic assessments. So basically everything. Uh, she holds a PhD in public policy from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and an MA in economics from the Delhi School of Economics. Welcome, Sudeshna. It's uh, wonderful to have you here. Uh, our next panelist is Lisa Pinsley, the head of Africa for energy infrastructure at Actus. Uh, Lisa joined Actus in 2016, where she opened the Cape Town office to focus on originating and managing energy investments primarily in Africa. She has 12 years of experience in power sector investing and 22 years of experience in emerging markets. She was previously at American Capital Energy and Infrastructure, Globalec, and AES. Uh, before she got involved in the power sector, Lisa lived and worked in Afghanistan for five years for UNDP and then as an advisor for the Afghan finance minister. She holds an MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School an MA in Literature from the University of Sussex, and a BA in Applied Mathematics from Harvard University. Uh, at some point, I'm going to ask her how that MA in Literature slipped in there. <laughs> um, and finally, our third panelist is Radhika Thakar. She's the Vice President of Corporate Affairs at Greenlight Planet, and she was also an award winner at this event in 2019. Uh, Greenlight Planet is a leader in distributing and financing solar home energy systems for off-grid and underserved households. More than five, 55 million people around the world use these products as their primary source of light and energy. She led the company's global growth from its initial start in India into Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and Central and South America. In her current role, she oversees external industry and policy relations and focuses on strengthening the internal culture, policy, and governance of the company. She also serves as president of the board of directors of GOGLA, which is the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, one of the reasons that I was excited about bringing this particular group of women together is because each of you approach energy access in such different ways and from such different perspectives. And I wanted to start out with a question to each of you that gets at where that came from. Uh, each of you has built a really fascinating career based on energy investment and energy access in emerging markets. And I'd love to hear from each of you in just a few minutes about the moment you knew that that's what you wanted to do uh, and why. And I'll start with Sudeshna. Thank you very much, uh, Katie. And it's great to be in this panel with uh, Lisa and Radhika. So today is Diwali, which is our festival of light. Uh, and a lot of inspiration really comes from my own country, my home country, India, where I grew up. And it gave me a sense of light changing lives. Uh, my family always had an electricity connection, very few in those days who did. Uh, and we suffered extensive power cuts. And I also saw many of our family relatives who lived in rural areas, depending on kerosene. I stumbled, of course, on pursuing energy work much later in my career. But the potential of energy to change lives really stayed with me throughout my adult life. Later on, in various uh, African countries, I have traveled in many far corners of Africa. And I've always been inspired by how much of the economy was driven by energy and how much of the household life was affected by the advent of energy. When I saw children, when I saw women, when I saw young people, it was amazing to see that, you know, how energy was changing rural life. Um, so I worked in uh, East Africa for many years, as uh, Katie, you were mentioning in your introductory remarks. 
And I saw so many young people with impressive academic credentials working on energy access. And that is exciting because it means that young generation is excited by this challenge. And that is what really keeps me in this job and makes me wake up in the morning and realize that you know I'm doing something useful with, with my credentials, with my experience and, and trying to make the world a little bit better place. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Sudeshna. Uh, Lisa, let's, let's same question to you. Thank you, Katie, and thank you so much for the invite. This is my first time at a C3E event and I'm so excited to be involved. So first off, thank you. Um, I think you mentioned at the beginning in my intro that I spent five years working in Afghanistan, first um, for UNDP on reintegration programs for former soldiers, which was mostly done through NGOs working on the ground, and then second for the Afghan finance minister. I found it kind of a fascinating education, I guess, in working in an emerging market. It was really my first time. Um, and with the UN, it was more the micro side of things. So how do NGOs work on the ground? How does development work? How do NGOs get funded? Um, how do you monitor and evaluate things? And then when I worked for the finance minister, it was like a crash course on the macro side of an emerging market. So what does it actually mean when the IMF comes to town? You know, what do those meetings mean? What do the benchmarks mean? What does Sudeshna do at the World Bank? And what do her colleagues do in the energy sector versus, you know, in, in direct budget support type of programs or, or, or other things? And what does it mean in terms of concessional loans and grants for, you know, the, the minister's budget going forward? Um, that said, it was fascinating, but what I was really excited about um, was what was happening actually in the private sector in Afghanistan at the time, where private sector companies were coming in and investing in emerging markets, not from the development perspective particularly, but with, with the goal of making money, but also building economies. So I saw um, mobile phone companies coming in. I saw agriculture companies coming in, manufacturing, all of this to, to, to make money, but have a positive impact. So I had this idea that I wanted to be back in emerging markets, but on the private sector side um, and to do something that was sort of tangible. I really needed to be able to touch it. Um, so I didn't really want to, I don't want to pick on any companies. I didn't want to sell soft drinks, you know, like from one market to another or brands or something like that. I wanted to, to build something. So I applied to business school. This was 2007. Um, I went to Chicago, I saw my first wind farm out in the Midwest, and it was a kind of the time of the renewables revolution. And it all clicked. The other thing I learned in Afghanistan was how to work a generator. <laughs> so there was very little city power, which is very normal for many emerging markets. And this, just the day-to-day -day working with, oh, power's out, go turn on the generator. Oh shoot, somebody forgot to buy diesel, you know, and all of that to really understand the, the, the impact that power makes um, on, an, on an economy. So I'd say it was a series of moments, but that's what really brought me to, to where I am today. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. That's an incredible story. Um, okay, Radhika, same question to you. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Um, and I'm, I'm so inspired just hearing, you know, Lisa and Suzanne of stories. And um, a lot of that resonates with me as well. Um, I think in... In my case, I, I came into this field a bit by chance. Um, I, I'm not an engineer. I didn't study renewable energy uh, in, in my education. At the start of my career, I've always been interested in social equity and justice. Um, and so after some years in the public sector and in healthcare consulting in the US, uh, I had an opportunity to join Greenlight Planet in its very early days. Um, and I was drawn by the company's commitment to using commercial means to solve a very large global development challenge. Um, but admittedly in the first month or two, I was like, I felt a bit of an identity rift. Um, I'm not a technology person. And here I was selling effectively gadgets, right? Um, I was learning how to explain how solar energy works, um, the efficiency of lithium batteries, uh, lumen output, and, and why does that matter to customers? Um, and I, I didn't feel Personally, I wasn't sure I could bridge, you know, this reality uh, that I was kind of selling consumer durables with my social drive. Um, but this changed drastically uh, when I 
when I made my first um, trip to, to rural villages uh, and understood how our products work, right? Um, so I was in Bihar uh, in, in India. And um, in particular, I remember visiting a house and I can still imagine it in my mind right now. Um, what, what struck me was the family had recently repainted all of their walls, bright, fresh, white. Um, but they left one patch uh, exactly as it was before, which was really dingy uh, and, and nothing even close to white. Um, and they kept that patch as a reminder of the ash that had previously covered their walls, um, and not just their walls, but the air that they breathed and, and the insides of their lungs really, um, from all the kerosene uh, lamps that they used for light before they had discovered Sun King, our, our solar lamps. Um, and that was just so profound for me. Um, I realized in that moment that these were not gadgets. Uh, these were transformative, um, really life-changing uh, instruments, really simple, really tiny. You know, our first product was like this big, uh, you know, it, it was nothing complex. And yet it had this tremendously profound impact on, on this one family and, and really every, you know, family that, that we'd come in touch with um, on those days. Um, and I realized that, you know, how simple what we had to do was if we could just get our solar lamps and home systems to every household that lacked energy access, we could transform, you know, uh, a billion plus lives. Um, not actually that simple, but, uh, but you know, it, it, it's such a simple solution uh, to such a massive problem. And I think that's what, that's what kept me going. And so what I thought was going to be like a one or two year stopover at this early stage company has been nearly 13 years. Um, it's been incredibly challenging, but super rewarding and, and really meaningful throughout. And here I am in renewable energy. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um, Lisa, I'm going to jump to you because your work at Actus focuses on managing and investment, investing in uh, energy projects of various kinds. And I think that's something that probably a lot of people in the audience today are familiar with, but you're doing it in uh, emerging, sometimes very fragile and, and challenging markets. Um, and that comes with many particularities, but I'm, I'm wondering what you think is the primary difference uh, in how you have to approach your work in those markets compared to what people might be used to in the US or Europe? Yeah, sure, thank you, Katie. And, and maybe right before I answer, I'll just kind of clarify. I think a lot of times people think investors in emerging markets are, are either multilaterals or development agencies or have a double bottom line. And um, although sustainability is at our core, we are a private sector player looking to make returns for our investors. So Actus, where, where the private equity fund where I work is we've raised about $24 billion and it's mainly from pension funds, institutional investors, sovereign wealth funds and things like that. So, you know, I think it is a space where um, institutional investors are starting, starting to go um, and we're helping to bring them there. But, how do I find it different than um, the more developed markets? And these are inefficient markets. And I kind of love that. <laughs> and I think the main, one of the main things that gets me up and on Zoom eight hours a day, or I just made my first actual business trip to Uganda for eight days, or I went on site visits and I met with government officials and it was so refreshing. But it's the people that you meet. And it's, it's both the, the people around the table of a deal and, and then obviously the impact you make on communities um, and landowners and, and everything. But, but the people around the table, I feel like are, it's not a numbers game in, in these markets. You must, you need to make money and the numbers need to work. But um, if, if you are not engaging on many different levels, there's small markets in a way, um, people at the, the regulator, the utility, the finance ministry, the presidency, they all, they all went to school together. There are, you know, many of them are related or they work together back when at the utility. Um, and so it's, they're, they're very small markets. And even though there are laws in place, you need to really find your way around these markets and partner and talk to the right people um, corruption is an issue. I had once the head of procurement at the Kenyan utility. I knew he liked tea. So I brought him a $5 box of rooibos tea from South Africa, which, which I knew he liked. And he wouldn't take it. 
because he was so afraid that somebody would come and then accuse him of, you know, getting uh, brushed up by a big investor. And they are doing lifestyle audits now, people who work at that utility. Or my local partner, um, also in Kenya, who started out his life as a cardiologist. And one of the best ways that he can assemble government officials is because he was their doctor. So when your cardiologist calls, you take that call, you know, it's not, he doesn't have a lot of vested interests and in businesses around government, but it's just a small market. And, and I, I enjoy that. It kind of, it, it, I think it plays to my strengths. Um, but I also just enjoy how those, how those deals are done. I'll stop there. Thanks, Lisa. Um, as a former U.S. government official who operated under very strict gift rules, I identify with how much he probably wanted to take the tea um, and just couldn't. Um, so the theme of this year's session is about equity, and it's something that we've seen pop up more and more around conversations related to climate and energy access, which is a fantastic and, uh, frankly, belated uh, development in this field. Um, I want to turn to uh, first Sudeshna and then Lisa again. Uh, obviously, while we're sitting here, uh, COP26 is happening in Scotland. And this year, we've seen a lot of heads of state from emerging economies come forward, um, including from India, Uganda, Nigeria, Malawi, uh, just in the past few weeks with very strong statements about the need for continued energy development in their countries. Um, and at the same time, we've seen high emitting countries, including the US and countries across Europe, um, kind of yet again, not go far enough in reducing their own emissions. And I'm curious from both of you, how your understanding and your thinking on climate change particularly has shifted over time uh, in relation to your work. So Sudeshna, I'll start with you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Katie. It's a very relevant uh, question this week. Um, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, after many years of working in Africa, I now work in Europe and Central Asia region. Uh, the countries that you named in Africa, Nigeria, Uganda, you know, it, it, there's the entire African content, uh, continent taken together is very, very less than 10% of the total emissions. So it doesn't matter so much how what kind of promises, even if they are upping their game, it's still not enough unless the big emitters uh, really sort of change the game. And now I work in a, in, in a part of the world where there are these big emitters like Russia, Kazakhstan, Turkey. Um, and you realize that, you know, how difficult it is, how tough, challenging, multidimensional energy transition is. You know, it's so easy to come up with the reports to show the uh, transition pathways, decarbonization pathways. I think we are all very good at modeling. Um, reports come out all the time about how, how the net zero will, will happen. But, you know, when we work, for us in the World Bank, we work with the clients on both the policy dimension as well as, you know, implementation. We, we are both at the upstream as well as in the downstream. So we work with the countries on the implementation of some of these energy transition uh, policies. And you really get to realize how politically sensitive, how tough, uh, and how sort of sensitive some of these, uh, some of these topics are. And, uh, and also, it is important to realize that the building blocks need to be put in place for net zero by 2050, 2060, 2070, whatever the ambition the country is coming up with, the building blocks need to be put in now, even yesterday. But you realize that the countries are very ill-equipped to, to think about it. And what, what I see as I work with so many of our clients is that we focus on the opportunities. We constantly talk about how important energy transition is as an opportunity rather than just as a cost. Because most of the time, the politicians always talk about the short-term cost because the vision of the politicians is also short-term. But when you think about the longer-term benefits and you bring in much more about the benefits to the population and to the uh, to the politicians and to the policymakers, that's when you realize that you know you have to think about it in a much more, because 2050, 2060, 2070 is so out there. People cannot even imagine how far that is, you know, to today sitting here in 2021. And, uh, you know, I did my PhD on privatization of, in, of infrastructure assets in the late uh, 1990s, early 2000s. And the issues were similar because there is there's a huge short term cost associated with people losing their jobs, et cetera, because of privatization. But there are also long term benefits of efficiency of, of financing, new financing coming in, et cetera. And all this happened in the happens in the context of a political framework with short term vision. 
So I also have much more appreciation of how politically sensitive decarbonization is, you know. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, we we have we come up with reports all the time from the World Bank, from IEA, from many, many agencies are coming up with it. But it's really, really tough to convince your electorate that how this long-term agenda needs to be broken down into bite-sized pieces. And we need to start with those activities and actions right now. Even yesterday, we are already late, you know. And, um, and you also realize how important the responsibility is to think about climate change for our children, for our grandchildren. Otherwise, what is a planet that we leave for them? So, uh, so I really take this responsibility seriously. I think everybody does, but you also see that it's, it's incredibly tough and, um, and challenging and multidimensional. Thank you. Thanks, Sudeshna. Uh, let's jump over to you, Lisa. How has your thinking on climate change and its connection to your work evolved over time? Thanks, Katie. I, I think having worked in, in Africa now, I guess 12 or 13 years, I've definitely perhaps come to a more nuanced view. Um, I, I was in Uganda when Museveni, the, the president of Uganda, published that article in the Wall Street Journal, solar and wind force poverty on Africa. You know, we have I think 15 wind and solar projects in Africa. So at my first reaction was negative. But when you get to the heart of what he's saying and what a lot of leaders are saying and perhaps um, perhaps uh, better ways <laughs> is that you know it is it does feel rather patronizing for the West who are the and some of the East who are the biggest emitters to be forcing their policies through their funding onto Africa um, and and forcing a choice between poverty alleviation and energy access and and only financing clean energy um, and this is in some ways causing more pain than good. Um, uh, in that there's been a backlash from the African countries saying, look, we don't have enough baseload power. Our electrification rate is still under 50%. And you're saying that we can't use our domestic gas resources and build one or two baseload plants that will affect hundreds of thousands of people in poverty with no electricity. Um, and so I've, I've taken a more, um, I'd say nuanced view on that. And I still support that um, in certain situations where it makes sense. But I think there are some fantastic low hanging fruit um, um, that would be a better focus for COP. And I think it has become a, a good focus. There've been some good announcements, which is actually where I'm sitting now in South Africa. We're still over 90% of the generation here is coal based. Um, and I think that the, the, the various um, uh, mainly Western governments are doing a great thing by tying significant funding um, to the decommissioning of that coal and then funding what they're calling the just transition, which is, you know, as Sudeshna was saying, just that, that short-term political outlook of, oh no, all my voters are coal miners in this province in South Africa, and I'm gonna lose power if they lose their jobs to try and help them on a medium-term basis with a significant amount of funding. And so that specific low-hanging fruit, um, I really hope comes through with real, real action. Yeah, thank you. I was really excited to see that get announced and, and hope that that sets a model for, for what can happen in other countries as well. Um, I'm gonna stick on the theme of justice and I'm gonna jump to you, Radhika. Um, you mentioned that justice was really one of kind of the driving forces that got you interested in this field in the first place. Um, and for someone like you, who's working on the very small scale of energy access, um, are there, is there an important question or a challenge related to justice in the energy access world that you don't think enough people are thinking about? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when we look at on-grid households, so the, the opposite of, of, of what I do, of what we do, um, really everywhere in the world, I think it's important for us to remember that they were able to access the grid. And I think all of us here were able to access the grid thanks to massive public infrastructure investments, right? Um, individual households didn't say, I think I want the grid and, and go and build it for their house. Um, the public works brought the grid to them. Um, and you know, on the other side, when we look at off-grid homes, they're expected to pay for their own energy. Uh, the source of energy and, and how they use it, the generation as well on their own. So whether that's as you know, simple as a kerosene lamp or a diesel generator or purchasing a solar home system like, like we make. Um, 
And, you know, and in most cases, when we look at those that are not well served by the grid or not served at all by the grid, they're also the most low income citizens or, you know, and low income earners in their respective societies. Um, and so not only can they not live as productively as their wealthier counterparts because they can't study at night. Um, they can't keep their businesses running after the sun sets. Uh, they can't access information or, you know, get online because uh, they don't have computers. Um, they also, you know, are paying so much more for so much less output. Um, and I think, you know, similarly kind of imbalanced expectations fall on clean energy companies like, like ours that are creating solutions for these lower income households, right? I think um, we've only been around or our you know, iteration of, of this um, sort of our, our, our segment of the industry has been around for less than 15 years. And I think most of the companies in, in my sector, the distributed renewable energy sector, uh, particularly working in Africa and in Asia, um, I'd say even younger than 10 years. Um, and it's really difficult for, for companies in our space to raise money to keep the work that we're doing going, um, to raise even really basic working capital. Um, and there's a lot of expectation that we should be profitable. And some of us are. Many are not, you know, most of the companies that are, you know, five, six, seven, eight years old are not there yet. They, they may get there eventually, but they're not there yet. And, and I think that that kind of imbalance, so there's this like outsized expectation that our sector should be um, profitable when we, when we are serving the hardest to reach, those that the, you know, that have just been overlooked because they are so hard to reach and so low income. Um, and yet, you know, who we're, I wouldn't say we're competing against, but sort of who we are doing the work uh, for or that couldn't reach um, has been subsidized for decades, and you know, in in the U.S. So over a hundred years, um, and most utilities are still not profitable. And so, I think that that inequity is is massive, right? At, at the sort of at the company level of like who's bringing energy to our customers, but you know, that all boils down to what can off grid households um, access, um, and how expensive is it, and and you know, who's who's enabling them to access energy. Um, so I think, you know, positive side of this is we are starting to see a shift um, and some recognition of this, um, definitely in some parts of the world, um, Kenya, Nigeria, Togo, just to name a few, um, have in recent years launched programs to subsidize energy access for the hardest to reach households. Um, and funding comes from the likes of the World Bank and other, you know, large donors. Um, but these programs are limited. They're really complicated to run in. And I think they're really important for the world to pay attention to um, if we are going to, and if we're committed to meeting SCG7 um, by, by 2030, especially. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit um, because we are at this incredible event that focuses on women who are involved in the energy sector. And I think in the international development world, we hear a lot of pretty general statements about the impacts of energy on women. Um, and they often uh, don't go very much in depth or aren't very specific. Uh, I'm curious first from you, Radhika, what does that really look like on the ground? Is there a specific example from your work that stands out uh, and, and really highlights the impact on women? Yeah, I'll share two really small um, stories that, that I think were, are, are quite profound or were profound for me. Um, the first is about eight or nine years ago, I was in Rwanda with, um, with a team of uh, photographers we'd hired to take some pictures to create marketing materials for, for our customers. And so we were in some of our customers' homes taking pictures of them going about their normal life using our solar lamps and solar home systems. Um, and for one of the pictures, we went into the kitchen, uh, which is a separate you know, how or like a separate room off of the main house um, with with the the mother that you know that the, the female head of the household um, and just preparing food like the normal meal uh, for her family over um, a wood burning stove and you know we closed off the door and we were taking these really you know beautiful pictures uh, showing our son King Lamb right next to her going about her normal work. And we were in there maybe like 10, 15 minutes trying to get the right angles and the right light. Um, and as we were in there, the smoke from the stove just took over this space. It was, you know, myself, a photographer, someone else kind of helping to set the scene and the woman. And 15 minutes in, I thought I was going to faint uh, because the fumes from the, 
the stove were just unbearable, um, so noxious. And I was just thinking, this woman, this is 15 minutes. A, a meal does not cook in 15 minutes. She's sitting in there multiple times a day, preparing a meal for her family, inhaling this, you know, this not these noxious fumes um, every single day. Um, and you know, just and, and you know, at the time we were not selling stoves, we. Um, and we're selling lights, but but that's just, you know, it, it's an example, right? A kerosene lamp does the same thing. Um, and that was just profound. And I think, um, you know, when you think about um, in in off-grid households um, in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and most of South Asia, it's women and children that spend most of the time indoors and who are most exposed to the, um, to the you know, to the black carbon uh, and, and just the, yeah, the, the terrible fumes there. Um, and so, so that's one. And then the other is, um, the story of one of our sales agents, um, Everlene, who um, goes door to door in her community um, and sells Sunking products. And, you know, I think that's just the reason she became such an advocate and so successful at selling her products is she had a very similar experience as the woman that I, you know, visited in, in Rwanda and knew that just how beneficial um, a solar lamp was and, and a solar home system was for, for her family. And she's been so successful in selling um, to to her community that she, you know, abandoned her initial career, which is selling bananas, um, in selling solar lamps and solar home systems. Um, she's well respected in her community, and has made enough money in doing this that she's, um, you know, been able to purchase land, a couple of cows, and is putting um, her entire family through through school. So, you know, I think um, women benefit tremendously from from clean energy. Um, and then are also incredible champions and allies to to really get clean energy into to more households around the world. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so Deshna, what about you from the World Bank perspective? I remember being at Power Africa and you and I actually talked a couple times about how to make sure that our programming was really not only targeting women as kind of consumers, but also just as Radhika just said, as, as agents of, of energy expansion and development. Um, what stands out to you from that? Yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks for asking this question because it's a topic very close to my, uh, my heart. Um, so I can also mention a couple of instances where uh, in Kenya, actually both of them in Kenya, uh, where I've worked for many, many years. Um, so we worked on this project called Kenya Off-Grid Solar Access Project. Uh, in fact, one of the winners of uh, this year, Rhonda, she was in my team uh, on this project. Um, and the first time that such off-grid solutions that Radhika was talking about were, were really provided at scale in 14 most underserved uh, counties of Kenya. So you can imagine these are the most remote and poor parts of Kenya. Um, and for this, you know, we did some field work and I went to some of the villages, et cetera, where our products would be, uh, would be sort of uh, available as a result of the financing of the project. Uh, so one of the counties was Turkana. Yeah, which is where Lake Turkana is. It's a, one of the largest wind uh, farms is in that uh, county. So, uh, so we went to the small houses, very, very small houses. And uh, you know, one of the houses where I met a mother uh, who had a small solar light, you know, and uh, it was very gratifying to see her using this to charge phones. And she, were ha she was having a number of the neighbors coming into the house and they were charging their phones in that small uh, solar light. Um, and then, you know, Turkana is in the desert part of um, Kenya. It was, it was very sort of a um, lot of sand there. And there are a lot of insects who come in in the night. So she uses that small solar light in the night to go through her entire little house to see if there are any, any insects coming in so that she can protect her children. And then you know, I was standing there thinking, my God, you know, can you imagine this? And these sort of insect bites are very, it can be very fatal for young children. So this woman is so dependent on this solar light to make sure her family is safe every night that those insects do not come in inside the house. So that was really profound uh, experience uh, for me. Um, the second one was um, a slum electrification program in uh, Nairobi and, and the World Bank supported Kenya Power, the national utility KPLC, uh, to provide legal uh, electricity connections. You know, you, in slums, you might see that there are a lot of these illegal connections. You know, there are a lot of these wires going, going in different places. So we, uh, through this project, we actually legalized a lot of these electricity connections and many of the new uh, consumers also came in, in um, through this program. Uh, so these were slums and... Um, 
where gang wars were very prevalent and it was very, very unsafe, et cetera. In fact, one of the KPLC uh, colleagues were telling me that one time he went with a watch uh, in, in the slums and by the time he came out of the slum, the watch was not there. And, uh, and the women and the girls, they found it very difficult to move freely in the night because it was dark. It was, you know, there were a lot of gangs. So it was very, very scary and unsafe for, uh, for women and, and young girls. But once the light came on through this our project and there were small shops run by women, often for braiding, braiding, you know, there was, it was very, very prevalent in, uh, in Kenya and East Africa. And girls felt much more empowered to go around and move around in the dark hours. And I felt so proud when I was there. I just felt that I could see young girls actually having uh, a life in the in the in the evening hours. They could at least get out of the house and, and do something. Otherwise, they were just stuck inside the house. And I just felt that this is this is really what development is. You are actually creating opportunities for these young women to do something with their life have commercial enterprises, et cetera, uh, and make money out of the, even the electricity connections that they have. Um, so these are really examples where you see that how electricity access can change women's life. Um, and not only sort of um, older women, but also young girls, you know, for their educational opportunities, et cetera, and also creating um, sort of uh, instances for, from them to make, uh, make some money uh, in uh, income generation activities as well. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, incredible story. So we uh, have a time, I think, for just another round of questions, and then we already have some coming in from the audience, and I hope those keep coming. Um, but I wanted to just get a sense from each of you uh, about specific examples of, of female leadership that you've really admired over the course of your career. Um, I mean, I know I can say that I've learned uh, from each of you in different ways. Uh, and I'm curious whether there was a specific role model or moment of leadership that stands out to you as an example of, uh, of female leadership. And I will start with Lisa. Thanks, Katie. I've been, I've been struggling to choose between two. So let me just quickly say two. First, I've always admired Elizabeth Littlefield, who was the head of OPEC, now DFC, um, uh, and then how she, you know, drove the bipartisan bill to increase DFC's remit, or OPEC became DFC. Um, I think she chairs MCOPA. Um, I tried to, to get her to be on one of my boards, but she was too busy, which I understand. And she I also, I think, wanted to be more on, on, on a, certain, a certain side of things, but um, I really respect what she's done. And then I also, because I'm taking two, uh, I know I'm not allowed, um, but my, my boss at Actis, Lucy Heinz, she's now the head of the, um, the energy group. So we just, just raised, you know, uh, 4.6 billion for emerging markets, um, some developed markets investment. She's got four kids. She has, you know, spent 20 years in private equity, traveled like a crazy woman, um, and really risen within a company and is, is such a also a fantastic spokesperson for our for our firm um, that uh, it's it's a it's I think a rare pleasure to work for somebody like her. Awesome. And for this question of all questions, you're allowed to name two. That's okay. We'll <laughs> we'll allow it. Um, Sudeshna, let's go to you. Yeah, I was thinking about it a lot that, uh, you know, I have met many very inspiring women uh, through my uh, career in the World Bank. But one of them who stands out, especially in the energy access space, um, is uh, my friend Dana Rishankova. Uh, many of you know her. Uh, you know, she was the first task leader of a program called Lighting Africa. Uh, and uh, it was it was a program, it was launched in 1999 with two pilot countries with Ghana and Kenya. Uh, so Lighting Africa was a program that really elevated these off-grid concepts into much of a reality uh, in the later years. But believe me, in 99, in World Bank, nobody wanted to touch off-grid. Nobody wanted to talk, uh, talk about lighting. Nobody wanted it. They thought it was completely marginal, completely um, irrelevant at that time. And it was definitely not a good thing for somebody's career, you know, to work on this off-grid uh, off concepts. But you know, Dana, when Dana was really uh, sort of persevered, and today she's the global lead of energy access in the World Bank. Today, uh, you know, everybody, all the energy specialists that we have in the World Bank work on off-grid. 
So it's really her contribution that made the World Bank really uh, bring off-grid into the mainstream of our uh, energy business. And uh, I and so many of our colleagues really draw from her passion, commitment, vision uh, to ensure energy access for all in Africa. As, as Radhika was saying, that we are all committed to energy access, uh, sustainable energy um, goal to have energy access for all by 2030. But you know, the seeds of that had to be sown much, much earlier. So Dana is definitely one of those people who really did the groundwork so we can, we can really uh, benefit from it today. Uh, tomorrow and until 2030. Hopefully the world will be a better place by 2030. Thanks to her. Great, thanks Sudeshna. And uh, Radhika, last to you. Um, gosh, I, I really struggled to think of a single specific person um, when I was pondering this and, and kind of a, a series of a women ran through my head and, and Donna was one of them actually. So Sudeshna, thanks for, for um, singing her praises. Um, I think um, I, I think I I still you know I, I'm not going to name a, a single person because I think for for me and in my career um, having a few really strong female mentors very early on was so instrumental to to how I've developed as a as a professional. Um, I think it was a couple of women who in very kind of ordinary um, common ways um, kind of advocated for me and um, taught me how to you know, raise my voice, um, how to, how to hold my own, even when I was the youngest or the most female in a room, um, and nudged me to take on bigger opportunities than I thought I was ready for, um, that, that built such a foundation for me in my career and, and were so um, important when I then made the leap to, to Greenlight and started building a very early stage company, um, and, and in very different parts of the world than I was familiar um, and where I was very often the only female in, in the room and very clearly an outsider. Um, and so I think uh, I, I share that, you know, kind of that it's these small, um, seemingly simple ways that are really important. I think that have been really important for me. And I, and I think I, I try to keep in mind um, in now that I'm a leader in, in at Greenlight and when I encounter women in, in, in our field, um, with competitors or just different parts of our industry that I think are so um, so important is it's not the big heroic things, but it's the small uh, constant um, opening doors, um, you know, inviting people to speak and, uh, and nudging people um, further in, in their path that, yeah, that, that really matter, have mattered to me. Great, thanks so much. So we are gonna move into a Q&A with the audience. We already have a bunch of really great questions coming in. Uh, I'm going to start with one. Well, I'm actually going to combine two questions. Um, we've spent a lot of time talking about the off-grid space. Both Sudeshna and Radhika have, have talked about that. Um, there's a question about kind of what are the challenges on the on-grid side? And uh, I'm going to send that to Lisa, but I'm, I'm going to add on kind of not only what are the challenges and what should be the priorities in thinking about developing on-grid infrastructure, but also how do you think about where the right balance is between where do we finance microgrids, where does that make sense, kind of what does the future look like that embraces um, all of those options? Thanks, Katie. I mean, I think first just on, on our kind of bread and butter, large utility scale on grid, um, uh, solar, wind and gas generators. Um, I think, you know, when we talk about Africa, it's 54 countries, each country has its own regulator, utility, ministry, you know, um, and, and set up. And, um, most of those economies are on the smaller side and some of them have conflict issues as well. So we, um, in order to be able to write bigger equity checks, we focus on roughly sort of the top 10 economies on the continent and still um, one of the issues is, you know, how, how many projects can you actually get done in the investment life cycle of a private equity fund? Um, so and that could be a function of actually how much demand is in country um, and how much it's increasing and how much they need to procure the utility in order to meet that demand. Um, it could be um, 
uh, not getting all the different parties around the table on a least cost development plan to decide actually what kind of technology and where do they want to procure next. Um, it could also be what we're facing now, especially um, uh, with more renewables is the lack of grid build out um, to get to the regions that are resource rich, whether that's um, very sunny places in the Northern Cape in South Africa, whether it's hydro resources and DRC, um, it, you know, they require hundreds of kilometers of new transmission lines, um, which, you know, in Africa generally are all still government owned and which requires long-term government concessional financing often from multilaterals, which can take a decade. Um, and so these are the things that um, can sort of limit the opportunity set. But then sometimes it goes it goes crazy, you know? I mean, South Africa just ran a bidding round for 2.6 gigs of um, wind and solar. Um, uh, you know, in Egypt um, has procured thousands of, of megawatts of, of renewables. So you need to be kind of on the ground and opportunistic about which markets you're working in. Uh, because if you just wait in one market for it all to happen, they might have two or three projects in a year and that's it. Um, but, but grid, I think, is becoming one of the biggest constraints. Um, on your question on, on microgrids, I mean, not, we've, we've followed a lot of the different um, uh, developments in the off-grid sector. Um, and I think, you know, it's, they're starting to, to take, it's starting to accelerate. And a lot of that was held back by regulatory changes that were needed. Um, and from our side, because we're kind of a larger scale investor, so we need to write large equity checks. Um, we are kind of dipping our toe now in the commercial and industrial space, but things like microgrids, um, solar home systems are not our investment focus yet um, because of the scale. Um, and so I think you find some of that is still requiring some multilateral backing to kind of get it to a scale where that makes sense for the private sector. I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's a great segue um, to Sudeshna too, who's at an MDB. I'm wondering if you have perspectives on this, Sudeshna. Yeah, thanks a lot, Katie. As you know, this is our uh, bread and butter uh, in terms of on-grid uh, projects. Uh, you know, we have to first acknowledge the fact that Africa, which is the last best, bastion of, um, of unserved population, which is about 600 million people live without electricity. Africa is different from any other region which has received electricity recently, which is, say, South Asia or East Asia, mainly because it's much more remote. The density of population is very, very, very scant in Africa compared to in South Asia. South Asia is the den most densely populated uh, part of the world. And as a result of that, the capital cost of uh, on-grid electrification is much lower. It's about three times or four times lower in South Asia compared to in Africa. So you are essentially in a continent where the fiscal affordability is much worse than in South Asia, and it costs higher. So that is it's a double double whammy, right? In in um, in Africa. So now what we have been doing and uh, a number of the other donor partners have also been doing is is a geospatial plan, trying to figure out how uh, what is the economic financial way of reaching everyone in the in the country and you realize there are some parts of the country where you can reach with grid because it's much more economically possible to do so some parts you can't reach with a grid where mini grids might be more possible or maybe the off-grid solutions market-based solutions can be more possible so we have been doing a lot of this geospatial plan to really map out the countries and and see almost like literally at the minute level to see uh, you know, what kind of economic uh, possibilities exist in terms of reaching with, with uh, specific solutions. The second point I wanted to make is the challenges. You know, The challenges, what you see in Africa is about the utility financial viability. This is something that, uh, that Lisa was also talking about. Uh, we did a big study on utility uh, financials in, in Africa, and you realize that pretty much every one of them is bankrupt in terms of they, uh, they do not meet their capital costs, none of them do. And and some of them meet their operational cost. And so that is really the situation. How would you bring up your investment capital to, to go for grid electrification if you do not even meet your operating cost? That is really the situation. So somebody has to pay for it. Either the government pays for it or, um, 
or the multilateral donor space for it. Otherwise, electrification in Africa will not happen. And of course, you know, you need to have the private sector come in at scale to provide the resources that are that are uh, required. And then the numbers that we come up with is, is about $25 billion a year, you know, in terms of looking at the entire value chain. It's a lot of money. And, you know, unless we have a situation where public sector, private sector really form a partnership to come together to come up with these kinds of resources, it's going to be 2030 is is uh, much sooner, you know, it will be, it will take a lot longer than 2030 to provide electricity to everyone. And other thing we should not forget is that Africa is also where the population is growing at the fastest. So we are almost running really fast, even to stay still, because the population growth is much higher than the, and the rate at which you can provide access. So that's why the number of unserved population is either increasing or remaining static. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a very complicated situation. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Sudeshna. Um, Lisa, uh, a bunch of people are interested in understanding how developing economies are doing on their kind of renewable energy and climate targets. And I know this isn't a focus of Actus, but you're sitting in South Africa, which is this really interesting case of a coal dependent economy that's also had hugely successful renewable energy auctions. Um, I'm curious if you have perspectives either on South Africa's climate goals specifically or more broadly. Thanks, Katie. Um, let's see, on South Africa specifically, South Africa has it, fantastic renewable resources. Solar and wind um, are, are natural here. And they also have a lot of land. Um, and so, compared to more population dense places, um, that's also not a constraint. Grid's a bit of a constraint, but the main constraint is political will more than anything else. So it's, you know, as we were talking about before, um, it's still, it's had a successful renewable program, but it's still, you know, I can't remember the exact figure, but probably, you know, five to 10% max of the generation mix is renewable and almost all the rest is coal or diesel. Is a tiny bit of nuclear. Um, and so it has quite a long way to go and it could, have, it could have gone further had it not been for the politics of coal mining here. Um, and, uh, and, and unfortunately, as, as Sudeshna was saying, you know, most of the utilities around Africa are bankrupt um, and because they're government owned have, have in the past been, been used by governments sort of in political ways. For example, not being allowed to charge cost-reflective tariffs. So every kilowatt hour they sell, they lose money uh, because it's politically not acceptable to charge too much for power. So this is, you know, because of the debt situation that ESCOM is in right now, that's a South African government-owned utility, it's an opportunity to kind of um, twist, twist the arm a little bit to to push towards those climate goals. So I feel optimistic about that <laughs> because they're really, really besides the politics, there's no reason they should be so behind in their goals. Uh, I mean, it was six years between, five or six years between renewables procurements and that was all politics. Um, I think around the rest of Africa, it is, um, the grids are much smaller. I mean, ESCOM has about 40 gigawatts of generation, whereas most other, countries in sub-Saharan Africa are a gigawatt or two gigawatts total. So if you if you add in like a Turkana 300 megawatts of wind, it's a lot for these um, systems to handle um, in terms of the inter intermittency um, and, and, and in the fragile grids. So um, they, they I, I sort of, I have, a, have less strong feelings for them, you know, I mean, versus South Africa, where South Africa could have made a lot further strides, I think, other countries are kind of doing what they can given their current situation, their current grid, their current ability to invest. Um, and, uh, in, and the multilateral assistance will be helpful um, to underpin that. Great, thanks so much, Lisa. Um, I have a, a fairly big and broad question here and I'm going to give it to Sudeshna. Uh, how do you see the transition to renewable locally generated energy changing the macro geopolitical balance? Uh, 
Actually, this is a very good question. And, uh, you know, when I was mentioning, of course, I get very passionate when I start talking about Africa's energy access. It's a topic that I have spent a large part of my career on. You know, when you think about the locally, uh, so I, I'm guessing the the, the uh, question is regarding the mini grids, you know, which is decentralized um, uh, sort of uh, renewable energy uh, systems. And what happens as a result of that is uh, it, um, there are some implications for the utilities, but there is also some implications not on the utilities, which is which sort of uh, protects it from fiscal imbalances. So, for example, you have um, there are a lot of mini grids, which are, as you know, there can be isolated mini grids, and uh, so they do not have any fiscal implications implications on the grid per se. Yeah, so they are they are almost like companies which are operating by itself. You know, we are servicing the local consumers. And they, if there is, a, uh, there is a systematic way of doing it, then the government actually says, okay, these are the areas, these are the sort of sites, please come in and, and, uh, and, and create your, uh, your um, sort of facilities. And you can charge the tariff that you want. Of course, there's a business model associated with, with it. The tariffs have to be uh, have to be at a certain level, et cetera. So there are various sort of transaction advisory services are usually provided to the government to make sure that such, uh, such sort of allocations of um, of um, sites to these renewable energy developers are made. But at the same time, you know, the, as the grid goes further out, how do you sort of, these mini grids also have to be connected then to the grid. So then it becomes a fiscal imperative because they become connected to the grid. So we have to think about it almost, on, almost in a continuum fashion. It's a dynamic situation that initially the isolated grids do not have any implications from a fiscal point of view. But over time, as they get connected to the grid, it can have a fiscal implication but you know we have to think about it that this is this is something absolutely essential mini grids i personally feel for rural livelihood rural um, rural sort of uh, economic development it's absolutely essential to think about mini grids as a very important solution uh, for uh, for uh, commercial enterprises for industrial enterprises and then later on uh, the grid can come in if they do uh, at all so thanks udeshna um Time has flown. I think we have time for just one last question. Uh, there was some interest in the connection between energy provision and health facilities. I think clearly in the context of COVID, we've, we've seen that and the importance of that. Um, Radhika, I'm not sure if you specifically have worked on health facilities, but I'm wondering if you have perspectives on what that connection looks like and, and how we're doing. Yeah, it, it's definitely not a primary focus of our business um, because the solutions we design are really, really intended for households. Um, they're, you know, kind of uh, much smaller solar home systems that can power lights, um, television, stands, radios, uh, mobile phones, but not necessarily like equipment for, for a hospital. Um, that said, uh, a lot of um, hospitals or clinics are quite small, um, you know, outside of the, the bigger cities or even peri-urban areas. And so um, there are a lot of um, hospitals who, you know, who face long power cuts um, and actually do use solar home systems, our solar home systems to keep light running in those long you know, periods of power cut, um, really important for, you know, delivering babies um, or just being able to like safely take care and uh, of patients and, and check in on them. Um, so, but yeah, I, I do think that, that the pandemic has highlighted the need for um, reliable energy at a much larger scale than, than, than we provide, certainly um, across, you know, off-grid or, or weak-grid areas. Uh, and I'm definitely hearing a lot more conversations about that, which is encouraging because uh, the need is not new. I think it's just it's just coming to the surface now, right? As, as we've you know all become a lot more aware of the capabilities and, and limitations of healthcare systems. Um, so yeah, while we don't address it directly, I, I'm, I'm optimistic about um, something more you know, reliable um, and, and substantial, uh, hopefully kind of coming around to, to serve healthcare facilities. Great, thanks so much, Radhika. Uh, we've reached the end of our session. I wanna thank all of our incredible panelists for participating. And I also wanna thank Stanford and the other hosts for uh, not only inviting us, but for showcasing the international side of these issues. Uh, it's incredibly important. Um, so thank you so much. And with that, Naomi, I'll turn it back to you. <laughs>